Chapter 20. We are now in uh, Section 5 of the textbook. <clears throat> section 5 covers the medical emergencies, uh, or medicine, as it is often referred to. Um, this obviously differs from trauma because these are the illnesses as opposed to the injuries. Um, of the remaining portions of the course, uh, this section is probably the toughest. Um, section 5, the medical emergencies, uh, there is a lot of information and there is a lot of little quirks to it. So it really behooves you to spend a lot of time uh, studying this section. Um, there's a lot of material. In fact, uh, the correlating part of this course in, at the paramedic level is the biggest area in which people wash out of the program. So um, it, it's important. There's a lot of information here. <clears throat> With uh, chapter five, chapter uh, I'm sorry, section five, section seven, which covers the OB and PEDS, is the other uh, really uh, intense parts of the course. Um, the trauma section and things that have to do with uh, ambulance operations in the end of the end of the course are are less uh, less intense but uh, they're very important but this, uh, like I said is going to be a, a whirlwind of a ride through the uh, medical emergency section so we start medical emergencies with the most common uh, request for EMS which is respiratory issues like all the other chapters uh, simply watching or listening to this lecture is um, no replacement for actually reading and studying. So if you haven't done that, do that at your earliest convenience. <laughs> so the advanced education standard is uh, the AEMT will apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based off the assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. There are a number of objectives for this chapter that are found on 508, 509, and 510 in the textbook. I'm going to hit on a few topics that you haven't probably touched on before in your career. Um, things like cystic fibrosis, we didn't talk much about cancer at the ENT level. Um, a few, uh, a little bit more in depth on things like pneumonia, some viral respiratory illnesses, and then the appropriate treatments to go along with. <clears throat> so patients in respiratory distress can deteriorate rapidly into respiratory failure and arrest. And death follows quickly unless measures are taken to restore ventilation and oxygenation. This is for everybody. And the most common cause of cardiopulmonary failure, or cardio, I should say uh, cardiovascular failure, in pediatric patients is respiratory uh, problems that go uncorrected. Uh, but still, as an adult, there is plenty of things that uh, involve your respiratory system that have the potential to be uh, fatal or near fatal. The sensation of not being able to breathe is terrifying. And anybody who's ever been short of breath uh, can attest to that. And the associated stress response continues to increase the demand for oxygen. So just feeling like you're unable to get your breath makes you more short of breath uh, because it actually uh, zaps your system of, of even more oxygen. So um, it, it's kind of a, it's a double-edged sword here. So <clears throat> The increased use of respiratory muscles creates that higher need for ox uh, cellular oxygen and that oxygen supply is already jeopardized. So we work harder to breathe. We use more muscles. Well, the more muscles we use, the more energy we need. The more sugar we use up, the more oxygen we use up. So to ensure open airways, adequate ventilation, circulation, and uh, oxygenated blood is really what we're, we're shooting at here. That's really the whole gist of the advanced EMT is to maximize those things. I mean, all EMS providers do, but when they designed the, the AEMT, uh, it's really, uh, that was what its big goal was, ensure airway, ventilation, and oxygenation. 
you know, and, and to take care of those that are immediate critical threats. We also have to have a good understanding of anatomy and physiology of ventilation and respiration, as well as the pathophysiology of respiratory problems. So to, to be able to put those things together will help us often um, do some critical thinking, do some uh, uh, clinical, use some clinical judgment in order to apply uh, s treatments to certain patients at certain times while others we wouldn't. Uh, we don't give albuterol to everybody. We don't give epinephrine to everybody. Uh, and that's why we have to have some understanding of those things. <clears throat> Here, think about it, and it goes with your, um, your case study in the text. All right, so to kind of review a little here, <coughs> cellular energy uh, is dependent on oxygen reaching the individual cell. If we don't have oxygen reaching the cell, we have anaerobic metabolism, which is significantly less efficient. Um, so we have to have that oxygen able to work with the sugar in order to uh, make the most efficient use and, and uh, creation of energy. The upper and lower portions of uh, the airway open to allow air to reach the alveoli. So we have to have that straight shot from the nose and the mouth all the way down to the alveoli. And it needs to remain open and clear shot uh, both for inspiration and for expiration. Then each alveolus is in close contact with the capillaries so that oxygen and carbon dioxide can be exchanged between the lungs and the blood. So if we recall, the alveoli, a very thin little air sac, has a one cell thick membrane or barrier that keeps you know, the air inside away from uh, the blood in the capillary, which is also basically protected by one cell wall or one cell membrane thick um, divider from the wall of the capillary. <clears throat> so we have a couple of very thin membranes or layers that, that kind of separate the, the gases in the blood uh, and then allow for uh, the exchange to occur. Remember there's numerous capillaries that run around the outsides of these uh, uh, alveoli and uh, we also have some elastic bands that kind of run around there that kind of give it a little bit of a kick as it starts to uh, to uh, contra contract back to its normal size. When we're also dealing with the blood we also have to have red blood cells uh, that have the appropriate amount of hemoglobin to carry oxygen to the cells. So remember, it's not just a one-stop shop. Uh, we have to have, we have to have blood. We have to have pipes. We have, have a pump. We have to have an oxygen source. They all have to be functioning at capacity in order to work right. So the body's temperature, and the acid-base balance, other factors have to be in proper range. So if the temperature is off, then we we burn things quicker, uh, make things so it's not quite as uh, open to transporting oxygen, acid base. We throw the acid base into an extreme one way or the other. The oxygen doesn't doesn't like to, to play well with the, the hemoglobin and makes it a little bit more difficult to attach. The right side of the heart has to be available to receive some deoxygenated blood and move it to the lungs. If we don't have that, um, then we never can reoxygenate that blood. The left side of the heart has to be able to receive that oxygenated blood from the lungs and then pump it out through the arterial and capillary system to get it to the cellular level. Anything that interferes, any, interferes anywhere with those conditions leads to hypoxia, cellular dysfunction, and death. That's really what we're, that, that's a, a good quick summary there. The need for oxygen, the cells must produce energy to carry out their function. So if it, whether it's conducting an electrical impulse from one nerve cell to the next, or maybe it's contracting in, in a muscle cell. Maybe it's uh, um, lining something and protecting uh, it from uh, you know, uh, ant uh, antibodies or antigens, sorry. And, uh, or maybe it's just simply um, moving um, 
a signal from one place to another. So there's lots of things that it potentially can do. It has to have oxygen, it has to have energy in order to do that. The energy production and the presence of oxygen, again, is aerobic metabolism. Uh, it's very efficient, results byproducts that are easily eliminated by the body. Remember, those byproducts are things like CO2 and water. Very easy for the body to, to dispose of. Um, even if necessary, the body can recombine some of them and, and make it into something else that it needs at other times. So the pulmonary system and the circulatory system obviously have a, a very, very important relationship. So we have the end organs, which we'll look at the top and the bottom of this picture as the tissue cells, so lower body, upper body. Um, whether you want to call it brain, you want to call it liver, you want to call it a toe, whatever. Um, that's what we're actually working to uh, keep running at capacity. By doing so, the lungs supply the circulatory system with the oxygenation that they need and they remove the waste CO2. And then it's the circulatory system job, of course, to, to move the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. So the structure and the functions of the lungs, the, the lungs are a spongy tissue uh, with millions of microscopic air sacs called alveoli. Um, the, the actual solid, and I don't like to use the word solid, but the sponge, if we think about it as a sponge, so the parts of the sponge that are actually there as opposed to the open little cells, um, that sponge tissue in the human body would be called parenchyma parenchyma. And uh, that's the spongy tissue. And then we have the alveoli, which are the, the air sacs that we see in the sponge as well. Um, if, uh, another interesting little tidbit here, if we were able to take out uh, all the alveoli in the body, in a person's body, crack them open, lay them out flat, uh, they would cover well over half of a tennis court. Um, and in some cases, closer to a full tennis court. Um, and that's how much surface area they have. So that's that's fairly impressive to know that, hey, there's that much surface area amongst all these itty-bitty tiny little sacs throughout the body. This is what allows that gas exchange from the internal environment and the external environment, or as we call it, the atmosphere. So to lead down there, <laughs> we obviously have a, a number of tubular structures. And those tubular structures, um, include everything starting at the nose and the mouth, the combining the back of the throat to make the pharynx. Uh, the pharynx then goes down to the epiglottis where it divides uh, and, and goes into the respiratory tract or the uh, uh, gastrointestinal tract. Once in the uh, respiratory tract, we, we're talking about the trachea. Uh, the trachea um, has, uh, at the top of it, has the larynx, which has the vocal cords in it. And so it's all uh, protected from the, uh, the pharynx by the epiglottis. As we follow the trachea downward, um, it breaks uh, right about your suprasternal notch. Uh, so the very top bony part of your sternum, right around in that area, it breaks uh, at what's called the carina. The carina is the fork in the road that leads to a right and a left main stem bronchi, or what are also referred to as primary bronchi. Uh, the bronchi divide into smaller branches that serve as lobes uh, of the left and right lungs. So you have some uh, fairly significant sized uh, bronchi that feed the various five lobes. Remember, there are two on the left and three on the right. And they will continue to, to branch out, branch out, branch out, much like, say, a, uh, a bunch of grapes. Uh, they'll br branch out, branch out, until it gets then down to the alveolus. So within the bronchioles, within the bronchi, um, and to an, a degree within the trachea, <clears throat> there are smooth muscles. Uh, and those smooth muscles uh, in there uh, respond to beta-2 stimulus. So they respond to epinephrine, beta-2 beta uh, being the, the main uh, uh, sympathetic uh, receptor that we find in the lungs. Beta 1, remember, is the heart. Beta 2 is the lungs. 
So the respiratory tract has lots of little other cells within it that create different mucus and different other uh, chemicals that are intended to help protect the respiratory system. Uh, they also have cilia along them. Um, and the cilia are the little hairs that keep uh, kind of sweep out the lungs. So I like to think of this as you kind of see some of those pictures under the ocean in which you kind of got things just moving in the waves, you know, whether they're like little pieces of uh, seaweed or some various other uh, organisms under the water that kind of sweep in a motion. Well, they sweep things up. So as you get foreign bodies down into your lungs, these cilia sweep things up, try to move it up towards the pharynx so it can be gotten rid of. The interesting thing about these cilia is cilia are paralyzed by smoke. So those smokers in the room, or uh, the smokers that you know, have paralyzed their cilia. This is also sometimes referred to as the mucociliated escalator. Mucociliated escalator. Because it combines with the mucus to kind of destroy stuff. So the, think about the mucus as kind of being an acid. It secretes the mucus onto whatever it is that made its way in there. Starts to kind of dissolve it and break it down, try to get rid of it. And then the cilia move it up. They move it up and they move it out. Well, people who um, are smokers paralyze the cilia. They still create the mucus, but the cilia then can't sweep it away. And so it starts to kind of accumulate. Um, hence the reason why we start to see lung, lung issues uh, develop in people who are smokers. The, uh, interestingly enough, though, within about 48 to 72 hours after somebody stops smoking, uh, they will wake up their cilia. Uh, the cilia are no longer going to be um, paralyzed, and uh, then the smoker uh, will start to usually hack up a lung, as they believe, and it's actually as a, uh, a result of the cilia waking back up and, and moving stuff out of there. So people think, oh, man, I'm getting... I'm getting worse because I'm not smoking. I'm getting sick because I'm not smoking. Well, no, they're just moving the sick stuff out that was there to begin with. So the walls of the, the most distal or the terminal bronchioles and the alveoli are a single cell layer thick. So they're very, very small. And then the alveoli and the capillary are separated by a very small amount of extracellular fluid. And we're talking minuscule amounts, almost... Um, you know, it's almost like it's a little bit of a uh, um, filler, uh, not even not even a filler, kind of like mortar between bricks, I guess, that uh, kind of goes in there and it just kind of keeps them at a, at a kind of steady distance, <clears throat> but it's not much. The alveoli and the capillary uh, walls um, are uh, have this very close relationship. Uh, again, they're very, very thin, so uh, things can move in and out fairly readily. We also have to have the respiratory membrane in place, and the respiratory membrane uh, covers the really the outside of the lung parenchyma and the inside of the chest wall. Remember, this is also called the pleura. Um, so that that's uh, responsible for keeping uh, the uh, Right, so the respiratory membrane is responsible for keeping the, um, uh, the surface tension uh, within the lungs. Uh, the direction of diffusion of gases depends on the concentration on each side of the cell membrane. Remember, it wants to make things all equal. So if we say within the alveoli we have 21% oxygen, and maybe in the red blood cells we have 16% oxygen, well, the body's going to say, hey, I need to equal this out. And so um, it's going to flood the red blood cell with the uh, significantly higher concentration of oxygen. There's a whole lot of 21% oxygen in the atmosphere, and there's very, you know, there, there's so much less of that 16% oxygen in the red blood cell, so it floods it. Likewise, um, the minuscule amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere is hanging out there in the alveolus, and then the 
red blood cell comes by with its significantly higher CO2 in it. And so that CO2, that high level of CO2, then is going to flood the alveoli to try to even things out. And uh, in that case, um, a significant amount of that CO2 is then lost to the alveoli, and we exhale it out. All right, so how do we actually do the process of ventilating? How do we move the air in and out? So with um, the stimulus from, remember, uh, the baroreceptors within the body that are detecting high levels of CO2, or if we have to operate on the backup system of low levels of O2, um, it sends a stimulus to the brain. The brain says, okay, well, we need to breathe more. The brain will then use a variety of nerve paths, particularly the phrenic nerve uh, and a few others, and uh, send a stimulus down to the chest. It says, okay, let's take a breath. <clears throat> when it does that, the diaphragm contracts. It moves downward. Remember, it is a um, dome-shaped organ, dome-shaped muscle. So it, mo it actually flattens out, comes down into the abdominal cavity. Um, and then the intercostal muscles and then some of the other uh, accessory muscles from around the chest and the neck area and the back pull the rib cage up and outward. That creates a negative pressure inside. That negative pressure, provided that there is a patent open airway, then sucks in the air. So that in lowers intrathoracic and intrapulmonary pressure. So it means that by expanding that chest wall, the same amount of air still remains there, but it gets pulled out. Uh, it gets pulled much thinner, so therefore there's less pressure, and that creates that vacuum. Ventilation is stimulated by the increase in CO2, or the decrease in O2, depending on which it is. So this is from the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid. It stimulates the inspiratory center in the brain in the medulla oblongata, which is up in the brain stem. And then the inspiratory center sends nervous impulse to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles, and they contract. Muscular contraction increases the volume of the thoracic cavity. Inverse relationship of volume and uh, of a gas and its pressure. So the same amount of, of uh, gas is there, it's just spread thinner, therefore lower pressure. The air moves from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. Then the process of exhalation, the intercostal muscles relax, the diaphragm relaxes, everything goes back to its normal position, therefore it presses, it compresses more air in there. That air is compressed, it's a higher pressure now, it increases the interthoracic and intrapulmonary pressures, and it pushes the air out, provided that we have an open uh, airway. Uh, remember, that is the passive process. It is an active process to inhale. It takes energy to do that. It is a passive process to exhale. It's just a natural relaxation. The amount of air uh, in t uh, for tidal volume, the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs, is generally proportionate to that adult's size. So it's roughly 5 to 7 milliliters per kilogram of weight. So if we said we had a 220-pound person, which is 100 kilograms, 100 kilograms times 5 is 500. So, um, and in most cases, the larger you are, you're probably going to be closer to the higher end. But, so. There is also the anatomic dead space. So if we draw in on average 500 milliliters, 150 of that is lost in those airways. It's in the pharynx, it's in the larynx, it's in the trachea, and the in the larger bronchi. It's unable to be exchanged. It just is filling. Uh, it's the pusher and the puller. The process of expiration is stimulated by the herring brewer reflex, and the herring brewer reflex is basically a stretch receptor. So that herring brewer reflex uh, detects that, hey, we're, we're uh, stretching things out. It's time to, uh, to stop inhaling 
and then let's get rid of some of that extra um, pressure that's within. So it pushes the air out. So why does the respiratory rate increase in hypoxia? When the, when the patient has low oxygen levels, usually in conjunction with high CO2 levels, the body says, how do I get more oxygen in? How do I get more CO2 out? I breathe faster. Or I can breathe deeper. So, and what's the significance of a patient's experience of anxiety uh, in respiratory distress? So the, the significance of a patient's experience of anxiety in respiratory stress. If you've never had a, a breathing problem before, it's going to obviously be much more critical than somebody who has chronic breathing problems um, who are able to, to detect this a little better and see, say, okay, I'm not quite, I'm not as bad off as I, I have been in the past. So it's not going to create quite as much stress on their body um, if they have some, some experience. So as we start to talk about uh, the various respiratory problems, uh, we have to also understand that there's varying degrees of respiratory distress. Um, and uh, when we talk about that, we really kind of look at beyond normal breathing, or eupnea if you recall, three major categories of respiratory insufficiency, we'll call it. <clears throat> those being respiratory distress, respiratory failure, and then finally respiratory arrest. I believe we've seen this chart again uh, in the past, or seen this in the past, so hopefully it's not uh, completely foreign to you. It would be a very good thing to commit to, uh, to memory. Uh, we'll start with the first column of normal breathing or eupnea. The respiratory rate is typically 12 to 20, tidal volume, typically free movement of the air, adequate depth, so it's, it, it moves uh, the air in and out very nicely, uh, and you have a very, uh, you have a little bit of a chest excursion where the chest moves out and in just a little bit. Breath sounds, they should have no abnormal breath sounds, um, and they're typically present and equal in all lung fields. Now that, we have to take that with a grain of salt. People can live with one lung, so if you have one lung, you may not have breath sounds on one side. It could make your uh, patient caregiver just a little bit uh, nervous. I think that's kind of a fun thing they like to play. Work of breathing is normal. Uh, the patient's appearance generally has good skin color. Um, in any interventions, uh, oxygen by nasal cannula might be indicated if there's a specific complaint history or clinical finding. Respiratory rate for respiratory distress. Uh, this may be normal, uh, but might, uh, but likely slightly outside the normal range. It's really more of probably a feeling that they have. Um, their tidal volume, they can have an increase or a decrease in tidal volume. They may be working extra hard to breathe or can't get any extra air in. Breath sounds could include strider, ronchi, rails, uh, which are also crackles. It can be very diminished, can be unequal may not even be the same throughout the one lung. They usually have some slight to moderate increased work of breathing. They're generally anxious. Necessary interventions may or may not actually be non-rebreather. Uh, it depends kind of on what we're getting. We may or may not um, need to go with a, a non-rebreather. Sometimes the nasal cannula is sufficient. Uh, we're trying to maintain that oxygen saturation at 95 or better. <coughs> In respiratory failure, uh, we are definitely outside the 8 or 30 range on a respiratory rate. Inadequate tidal volume may not even hardly be able to see the chest move at all. Um, they may have a variety of different sounds. They have definitely increased work of breathing, but probably showing signs of fatigue. So they may be slouching over. They may be uh, unable to hold themselves upright. They may be put, uh, you know, leaning on their arms to keep themselves upright. Um, they usually have a very anxious appearance and then start to become a decreased level of consciousness. They may have some confusion, probably cyanotic. This is definitely somebody who we're going to probably need to assist ventilations, possibly with the CPAP depending on their issue, um, or at the bare minimum, uh, bag valve or potentially a bag valve mask to ventilate them. 
uh, should they be uh, truly that uh, much inferior. You also see the throw pivot on there, which is the, the command valve. Um, and then finally, in respiratory arrest or apnea, uh, they will have uh, agonal or no respiratory rate, minimal to absent tidal volume, absent breath sounds, minimal to absent work of breathing. They will have a decreased level of consciousness. They're probably cyanotic, if not uh, ashen. Um, and you definitely need to ventilate these people, uh, provided that you know it's not a do not resuscitate or what have you. So. Hypoxia and exhaustion indicate a respiratory failure and an impending respiratory arrest. If they don't have the basis that they need to keep themselves going, um, they're going to arrest fairly quickly. Respiratory arrest or apnea. Uh, this is ineffective respiratory re uh, effort. Um, and uh, cardiac arrest will follow quickly if we do nothing. So some some tenets that we have for um, trying to support our respiratory distress patients. First of all, we're aiming to provide an SpO2 of at least 95%, not higher. Sitting upright or leaning forward uh, generally provides the greatest comfort for these people. Uh, because there's less pressure from the chest wall being applied to their lungs. So it allows the lungs to, to move much easier than if they are being um, impinged by uh, the lungs. I'm sorry, by the chest wall. Uh, you know, whether that has more to do with uh, adipose tissue on the outside, the muscles, bones, etc. All patients with inadequate ventilation require supplemental oxygen and assistance with a bag mask device or pocket mask or a pro pivot if you decide but um, if they have inadequate ventilation you've got to support their ventilation uh, unless you have you know a DNR or whatever but uh, and then maintaining the patient's airway breathing and circulation uh, are critical uh, again it's basic stuff saves lives so as we start to assess our patient uh, with the respiratory emergency, uh, we start to look for uh, a variety of, of things around. We have the scene size up. So we're looking for things such as, uh, you know, is the scene safe? Is there something that caused this person to have a respiratory uh, emergency? So did they get exposed to, say, a, a plume of uh, anhydrous ammonia? Uh, form your general impression. So from the doorway, what is your gut feeling about this patient? Maybe they have a little noisy breathing, but they don't really look like they're working hard. Maybe their rate's normal. Establish a level of responsiveness. <laughs> so are they AVP or U? Check their carotid pulse. Normally, if we have a, a respiratory emergency, if it's not respiratory arrest, we have a, a patient that's able to, to essentially look at us. Look around for other clues. Maybe they have a nebulizer. Maybe they have a metered dose inhaler. Um, so they have those sorts of things around. Uh, it's possible that uh, uh, that can tip you off that, hey, this person probably has some sort of a respiratory illness. They maybe have some sort of a, uh, a history that I need to be concerned with. It could be short term. Maybe they've come down with a pneumonia or something, uh, and this is kind of going to be a short term uh, nebulizers for a couple of weeks. Or maybe they have COPD and they have, they've been on these for, for years and years and years, if not decades. Um, but use those those scene clues. Maybe there's oxygen. Do they have oxygen set up in the house? Um, you know, is there nine miles of nasal cannula leading from the oxygen source to the, to the patient? <laughs> if we have inadequate ventilations, remember we must ventilate patient with preferably a bag mask and oxygen. So in our primary assessment, we're going to ensure that the patient has an open airway. If they don't, we will usually find that out pretty quickly. Um, if they are not alert and oriented, we then end up having to uh, try to ventilate them. If we can't get air to go in and out, probably don't have an airway. <clears throat> Remember, your first step is if you can't ventilate them, um, readjust the airway and try it again. If you still can't 
then you need to probably assume that it's an airway obstruction. Assess the adequacy of their breathing. What's those, those qualities that we have pointed out for the last couple of chapters, the rate, the breath sounds, the work of breathing, their appearance, the, uh, the, the regularity versus the irregularity, the depth, uh, all those things that we've kind of been pointing out along the way, those are the things that are important that we, we sum up, uh, we pull together to make our uh, decision on the adequacy of breathing. Assist ventilations with that BVM and supplemental oxygen. If we're going to supplement a patient's uh, ventilations with a BVM, we need to go with no less than 10 millimeter. I'm sorry, 10 liters per minute uh, of oxygen. Uh, and in most cases, they'll say 25 or 15. The reality of the matter is, is if you have a, uh, a reservoir that's a bag, um, some of them have like corrugated tubing. But if the reservoir where the next breath comes from comes from a plastic bag, if that bag is not collapsing, just like your non-rebreather. If the bag is not collapsing, then you're just wasting oxygen. It's just being spilled into the atmosphere. If the bag dimples or collapses about a half to a third of the way, uh, that's about right. That's about where your oxygen should be. If it collapses any more than, than a half, you need to turn your oxygen up. So we're going to assess a pulse, tachycardia can be an indication of hypoxia. Likewise, bradycardia can be an indication of uh, respiratory failure. Determine a transport priority. In many cases with respiratory distress, uh, it becomes a kind of a higher priority transport. And remember, respiratory distress quickly can go downhill. So when we move then to the secondary assessment portion, we look at what sort of things uh, will provide us the most relevant information. So we're looking for things like what sort of medications are they on? Um, do they take oxygen all the time or are they only on it part of the time? Uh, have they recently been ill? Do they have heart problems? Um, have they uh, recently changed in the medication? Uh, are they allergic to anything and now they have sudden onset of shortness of breath? So it, it's the sort of things that as we go along and we learn about these different problems, we kind of have to tuck, tuck in the back of our mind some of these little tidbits of info. So I mentioned medications. <clears throat> so here's a list of some drug categories uh, that you can uh, kind of start to familiarize yourself with. Uh, this is one of the toughest parts of advanced EMS is being able to relate certain medications uh, and, no, and, well, relating a name of a medication to a category and then knowing, okay, well, this is what that's generally for. So they give us the example of here, antibiotics. Antibiotics is one of the largest drug categories and drug classes out there. There are anything from penicillin, amoxicillin, azithromycin, ciprofloxin, erythromycin, um, vancomycin. I'd be talking something like... Uh, I mean, there's, there's so many different classes, uh, everything from sulfur drugs to, to penicillin base. Antibiotics are used to treat a bacterial infection. So pneumonias, bronchitis, upper respiratory tract infections, sinus infections, those sorts of things. We may have anti-inflammatory drugs, which would be in the steroid class. Prednisone, fluticasone, which is flovent, uh, triamcinolone, uh, beclomethasone. Those are all helping with a reduction of inflammatory issues of COPD, asthma, um, even uh, can be things like uh, uh, rhinitis, allergic rhinitis. So those of you that have hay fever, you might uh, take like uh, Nasacort or Nasonex. Those sorts of things uh, help to reduce the inflammation. We have other inflammatories such as mast cell stabilizers Chromalin solution, or, or Intol, uh, is a fairly common one, uh, although in and of itself it's not a commonly prescribed class. Uh, it reduces the inflammation by preventing the mast cells from, create, from releasing their, their mucus, basically. So things, uh, one of the biggest things that mast cells release is histamine. And we know that histamine um, has a huge uh, 
component of causing us to have some asthma as well as uh, allergic reactions. There's the leukotriene inhibitors, uh, Montelukast, which is singular, very, very commonly given medication. Um, but uh, singular, this in inhibits the release of the leukotrienes, which is another chemical mediator of inflammation. So if you want to think that about this a little bit, if we had a foreign invader come into our lungs, we have things like uh, the histamine that's going to release. Uh, we have things like um, leukotrienes that release. We have heparin that releases. So there's a number of different chemical mediators that all will be sprung on this foreign invader, and hopefully one of them is able to take it out. We also have bronchodilators. We have fast-acting, uh, short-term adrenergic agonists which would be things like albuterol and leave albuterol, Provenal and Zopinex. They're fast acting, they run out pretty quickly, they cause a, a smooth muscle relaxation. Um, people who uh, are on these have what they refer to as their rescue inhalers. So when they have a, have a problem, uh, or sometimes they're used um, prophylactically, so they say, uh, you know, before you go out and you play your game of tennis or football or whatever, take two hits off your puffer. Uh, and that helps to dilate them up a little bit so they hopefully don't have an attack. We also have bronchodilators that are longer acting, beta-2 agonists, terbutaline, uh, salmeterol, famoterol, uh, less commonly heard of names, but very commonly used drugs. Um, the uh, slower acting, uh, longer duration, uh, especially when uh, they take them from a tablet. They, these come in either uh, tablets or sometimes in syrups. Um, and uh, causes uh, the smooth relaxation, smooth muscle relaxation in the bronchioles and helps them stay, um, stay opened up for longer periods of time. So people will might maybe take these every 8 or 12 hours uh, to give them longer acting um, effects. We also have some anticholinergic agents like ipratropium. So those of you guys who um, are aware of the drug duoneb, duoneb is albuterol plus ipratropium. Uh, there's also teotropium, uh, which is spireva. But uh, these inhibit bronchoconstriction by inhibiting the parasympathetic action of the bronchioles. So it actually hits it from the other angle. Uh, it also helps to reduce the amount of uh, fluids that are readily uh, secreted within the, the smooth muscles. We have the xanthine class bronchodilators like theophylline or aminophylline. Uh, this stimulates the respiratory drive, causes the bronchodilation, uh, However, it also commonly causes cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, xanthines, um, things that fall in the xanthine class, caffeine is very closely related uh, to some of these. So any of you guys who have overdone it on your caffeine have had some, some effects that uh, maybe had some uh, palpitations or rapid heartbeat. Um, so it's, it's a similar class. It isn't the exact, but it's similar. Um, <clears throat> Cough suppressants or antitussives. So these these are another wide wide family of uh, medications. Uh, codeine, hydrocodone, dextromethorphan. Uh, those are the common antitussives. Uh, get, you get those uh, any of your cough syrups that have DM on the label. They have dextromethorphan in them. The codeine, the hydrocodone, those have to be um, bought off of prescription. And uh, they act on the central nervous system to uh, suppress any dry cough that you might have. Whereas the expectorants and the mucolytics, such as guaifenesin uh, and acetylcysteine, um, these thin out the mucus and allow it to be uh, more easily expectorated or spit out. Um, another good example that falls in that class is um, mucinex. 
We also have a number of pancreatic enzymes like pancreolipase or pancrease. Uh, these are used in the cystic fibrosis patient, which is a not a commonly uh, used or not a commonly uh, run into uh, illness, but there's enough of them out there, uh, and it helps support the pancreatic digestive enzymes that are blocked by the mucus secretion. People with cystic fibrosis are commonly thought of to have just lung problems, but it's actually problems throughout their entire body. And of course, oxygen. Oxygen is a is a gas. Uh, it's our atmospheric gas that our body thrives off of. So we give a little supplemental O2 uh, that can help uh, raise the oxygen levels so uh, people can can continue to uh, to thrive at home for a little while longer, potentially in the hospital, I guess. So part of our clinical reasoning process, um, understanding that pathophysiology of difficulty in breathing. What's causing it? It's not one simple thing. So we have to develop and test different hypotheses about the underlying cause of the respiratory emergency. So if we're talking about something like an anaphylaxis, where we have swelling and we have mucus um, that is causing um, decrease in, in airways. Uh, maybe we have congestive heart failure, which causes actually fluid to back up and kind of fill up the space between the capillary and the alveoli and eventually leak into the alveoli. Um, we maybe have somebody that has COPD. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll break it down even further. Somebody with uh, emphysema who has destroyed their alveoli and uh, they trap air in their alveoli and they can't move it out for new air to get in or somebody with maybe chronic bronchitis who has um, inflammation uh, in their, uh, their bronchi that narrows those passageways. Or maybe even a, a person with a pulmonary embolus who has a blood flow blocked to a certain area of the lungs so they don't oxygenate well. So there's lots of different reasons why this can occur. So some treatments to consider. Um, there's a lot of different potential treatments out there. We go, you know, we're, we're all familiar with, with oxygen. Uh, we've been giving oxygen ever since we've been in EMS. Um, so it's really nothing that, that is earth shattering. The way we now give oxygen uh, has changed a bit, where we're no longer just giving it to everybody. Uh, we're trying to maintain that SAT above 95%. Um, if we haven't done that already in the primary assessment, somebody we need to get uh, get to uh, very shortly. Um, we have some of our um, bronchodilator agents that we can give. I'll draw your attention to uh, the inhalers on 516 in your text. Uh, at the very top of the second column there, you have some inhalers and spacer devices. Um, services that use, I mean, that use meter dose inhalers they've got to use spacer devices. And that spacer device, it's often called an arrow chamber, it allows, uh, allows that person to take a couple hits off of one pump or one spray of the nebulizer, or the, uh, the inhaler, because it doesn't let it just escape into the air. Whereas if you just put the, the inhaler directly in their mouth, you hit it, um, and if they aren't at the right cycle in their respiration uh, or their ventilation, uh, then almost all that medication is gone. Whereas if it's trapped in that little chamber with a little flappy valve on it, that when they then take their next breath, they can draw it all out of there. Uh, the second picture, picture B there, uh, shows a uh, two different setups to nebulizers, whether it's with a mask or uh, with a mouthpiece. And finally, uh, C, the Advair discus down there, that is not a rescue inhaler. Um, that is more of a long-term daily inhaler, so that would be an, an indication that people have a, a long-term problem with respiratory problems, but uh, not something that they would be used uh, in an acute uh, asthma attack. So we have, we, we can go, uh, you know, to the extreme and talk about using advanced airways, whether it's a dual lumen combi tube or a superglottic airway such as the King airway. Uh, that we do the breathing for them. We support the airway completely with an artificial device. Uh, with that, of course, goes bag mass ventilation. Don't forget we have our basic things such as NPAs and OPAs.
suctioning and then positioning. We might go with a continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. Um, CPAP uh, is, of course, a, a splint, basically, uh, and it helps provide ventilatory support. It keeps things open so that airway, air can move in and out, whereas if we were talking talking about a patient who uh, is unable to breathe on their own, they don't only need their, their airway supported, but they need the air moved in and out for them. CPAP blows a little air their way, it makes it easier, it's non-invasive where a bag mask is, is invasive. Uh, IV fluids, uh, fluids can be important, you have to be careful with fluids, some patients like congestive heart failure patients, a little bit too much fluid will uh, um, overload them will fill them up and uh, make them uh, have even more difficulty in breathing. But some patients like pneumonia patients or asthma patients are, are routinely uh, somewhat dehydrated for the simple fact that um, they give off a lot of uh, fluids. They lose a lot of fluids as they breathe quicker. Um, you lose a, a significant amount of your body fluid that way. Um, nitroglycerin. Now, in, in most cases, uh, an AEMT is not going to use nitroglycerin in the treatment of uh, chest pain, or I'm sorry, in the treatment of uh, pulmonary edema. They will use it for chest pain, but not pulmonary edema. Um, paramedics uh, give some kind of weird dosings, sometimes very high doses of nitroglycerin to uh, patients with pulmonary edema from heart failure. Uh, AEMTs do use epinephrine, um, and uh, the epinephrine can be used as a bronchodilator uh, in this case, now understanding that epinephrine gets used for other things, uh, other different types of emergencies. But So those are our more common um, treatments at the advanced level that we would consider for respiratory emergencies. Of course, remember, start with the basics, the O2s and, and suctions and whatnot. So. And then as we reassess our patients. <clears throat> so ongoing respiratory distress, uh, and acidosis and hypoxia lead to exhaustion. They just eventually run out of their resources and they're done. So um, respiratory distress quickly goes downhill into respiratory failure and arrest. Frequently reassess the mental status. That's actually the earliest sign is when we see changes in mental status. Uh, changes in mental status cause uh, anxiety, they cause agitation and, and the patient become a little more anxious. Um, so uh, ch watching the mental status can tell you a lot. Maybe they calm down, so you're helping them. So be prepared to change treatment. Remember, we can start low and work, build ourselves up, work our way up. Um, we don't need to start at the very uh, biggest, baddest uh, treatment we have right off the bat. Um, I'll give you a, a good example of this. When paramedics in are thinking about intubating. So if we're going to intubate a patient, something that has to be kept in mind for uh, most of our, our, our patients is uh, once we put a tube in their throat and we are ventilating them, they become extremely hard to wean off of the ventilator. So why is it important to be able to differentiate between different underlying causes of respiratory distress? I think there's a fairly simple um, way to look at it when we talk about congestive heart failure versus an asthma patient. Uh, I mentioned that fluids can be very helpful, say, to an asthma patient or pneumonia patient, whereas fluids in the congestive heart failure patient can be detrimental. Some medicate some. Um, problems, some issues, some medical uh, complaints will deal okay with epinephrine as a bronchodilator or albuterol as a bronchodilator um, and others uh, won't respond to it. So a person with say pneumonia may not get much if any benefit from an albuterol treatment whereas a person with emphysema or chronic bronchitis might get a significant amount. So that's why we need to be able to think about these things and differentiate. And why do you think EMS providers might miss the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress and failure? Sometimes there's so much going on 
that it actually makes it uh, less clear what's happening. Sometimes we're more concerned with doing this, that, and the other thing, and we pay less attention to our patients uh, and their and the patient's um, progression, whether they're getting better or worse. But uh, and uh, we have these things popping up and distracting our attention. It can make it uh, much much easier for us to to not concentrate on the basics of respiratory drive. Now, here's an, a good example of something, um, and, and I would encourage you guys to actually do a, a good um, Google image search on clubbed fingers. Uh, or, uh, if you look up clubbed fingers, you'll see uh, much better examples than what they show here in the text. But a clubbed finger, um, basically, it is caused from hypoxia, chronic hypoxia. Uh, and it causes uh, some physiologic changes in uh, the end organ, or say the fingers and the toes. But and you can see how they're kind of showing you the angle of the of the nail and how it uh, grows from the tip of the finger. There, it almost in the clubbed finger almost is growing around the end. So if you've got say dogs at home in which their nail kind of curves around. Uh, the edge of their finger um, or their their toes actually uh, that's more of a quote unquote clubbed look to it uh, they're kind of a dome shape as opposed to most most fingernails if you look at them they're c-shaped from the end but for the most part they grow pretty straight out if you look at them from the side um, with the clubbed finger they're more of a dome shape uh, more of a an orb uh, as it forms around the end, end of, edges of the finger so, but if you note clubbed fingers, um, you can note that that person probably has uh, some sort of a respiratory um, diagnosis, whether that is, is COPD, which is most of the time it is COPD, um, but uh, it's caused from uh, chronic hypoxia. <clears throat> so, as we're talking about COPD here, um, Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are both uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Do not confuse this with asthma, which asthma is an obstructive pulmonary disease, which is not a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Asthma pops up from time to time. Uh, it's usually not something that plagues a person for long, long periods of time. Uh, but it is an obstructive pulmonary disease, just not a chronic one. So emphysema and chronic bronchitis uh, fit this class. And the pathophysiology of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So chronic bronchitis usually has much more mucus buildup. Um, it has kind of that smoker's cough. And it has some constriction and inflammation of the bronchi. Whereas the patient with emphysema has damaged the ability for their alveoli to stretch. They often will also have some mucus uh, and some retained mucus in their alveoli because they can't move it out of there. But it is not in the bronchi, it's in the alveoli. So the emphysema problem is usually alveolar, bronchi chronic bronchitis problem is in the bronchioles. It is the fourth COPD together, uh, the two diseases together, are, makes up the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. It's almost exclusively caused by cigarette smoking. 85 to 95 percent of COPD deaths were former smokers. Uh, and most patients with COPD actually have both emphysema and chronic bronchitis. However, uh, one of them tends to be the dominant uh, disease. And uh, uh, it, it all depends on the patient. Uh, it seems like we see more uh, emphysema. It seems to be the more common of the two. Um, and uh, so you probably are going to note the emphysema a little bit more often than chronic bronchitis. So it is a progression, uh, progressive destruction of lung tissue 
you see things such as decreased diameter of smaller airways, loss of elasticity of airways, uh, and obstruction uh, due to inflammation and mucus production. There's kind of a, uh, well, we're going to get to it here in a minute, but there's there's kind of a uh, a rule of thumb that we talk uh, that we call chronic or call uh, chronic bronchitis patients blue bloaters, and we call emphysema patients pink puffers. And we'll kind of get to that, so keep that in mind. Um, the the progressive destruction of the lung tissue causes a decrease in alveolar surface area for gas exchange usually also results in enlargement of the right ventricle and right-sided heart failure, something called core pulmonal. Um, but when we have this right-sided heart failure caused by pulmonary disease, it's called core pulmonal. So basically what it is is the lungs aren't, um, aren't as receptive to um, uh, accepting the blood. It's harder for the blood to get pumped through them and reoxygenated. Uh, and that causes some backup. Uh, and with that backup, uh, it starts to put extra pressure on the right side of the heart um, and causes then uh, heart failure. Cardiac dysrhythmias, uh, such as atrial fibrillation, are pretty common uh, in this uh, population as well. Remember, they've been oxygen starved for years and years and years. Um, and uh, we've talked about atrial fibrillation before. Uh, you can look that one up in the back if you want. But so, chronic bronchitis. Uh, chronic bronchitis is the blue bloater. These people are typically heavier, edematous, um, and have a kind of a constant uh, cyanosis look to them, cyanotic uh, appearance. Uh, the mucus producing cells in the bronchi, they increase in size. They produce much more mucus than normal, and that gives the patient the persistent smoker's cough. You know, that hacky, thick, roady um, cough. Uh, they will then start to decompensate, uh, or what we call exacerbation, uh, usually when they are afflicted by some sort of an infection. They're already under fire. They're already having a little bit more uh, difficulty maintaining. So when we have... Um, an infection, it zaps them that much harder. So if you want to take a look at page 520 in your text, it kind of gives you some graphic representation of emphysema and chronic bronchitis up at the top. So the chronic bronchitis patient, they, they their cough, uh, and it produces a lot of sputum, causes them to continue to cough. Uh, they'll often have wheezing from their bronchoconstriction. Remember, wheezing tends to be higher up in the tree than it does something like rails or ronchi because they have swelling of their bronchial uh, lining as well as that discharge of uh, mucus. They are prone to hypercapnia or high, or high carbon dioxide levels. This can lead to confusion, drowsiness, and headaches. Emphysema, on the other hand, this is an extensive destruction of the walls of the alveoli. It results in a reduced surface area for, for gas exchange. The lungs are all stretched out. The, to think about this one in kind of a realistic term, if you were to blow up a balloon and leave it blown up for a couple of weeks, and then you would go and you'd take the knot out of it and you'd try to deflate it, it would never go back down to its regular size. It's been stretched. So they would never return to the original size it was when you pulled it out of the package. That is what your alveoli are like when you have emphysema. They're stretched out, they've lost their, their kick, um, and they just don't have the same capacity that they used to. So the body increases its production of red blood cells to carry oxygen. So therefore, they have much more red blood cells floating around their body. They had to make more in order to do to carry the same amount of oxygen to the body uh, because uh, the, the body didn't have the interface. It didn't have the uh, ability for the red cells to come into contact with nearly as many healthy alveoli uh, to do the gas exchange. So if we have 
more red blood cells floating around in there, uh, there's, there's more people to share the work. The emphysema patient has the, the classic uh, nickname pink puffer. Uh, usually they're puffing um, uh, through pursed lips, so where they'll kind of keep their lips together and kind of uh, hold in some back pressure. It's basically they're causing themselves to auto peep. Peep is positive end expiratory pressure. Basically they're doing their own CPAP. Um, the pink comes from the extra red blood cells uh, that they have in the system that are uh, causing uh, them to have uh, a more red skin tone. They are also prone to acute exacerbations. They'll come down with some sort of uh, an infection. Um, and then these patients are typically fairly thin. Uh, they have very well developed accessory muscles, so they use their neck muscles a lot. They use some of their chest muscles and their pack muscles. Um, and uh, when they develop uh, and continue to work these, they, it leads to a barrel-chested appearance. So I think if we stop and, and think for a moment, uh, excluding breast tissue, which kind of throws off, for, for certain patients, throws off their, their perspective. If you were to saw somebody's chest in half, say right through about where the nipples uh, are or, or normally would be in somebody who doesn't have large breasts, um, if you would saw through the chest right through there um, and, and cut, cut them into a top and a bottom half, the basic shape of the chest is really oblong, so more of a of like a capsule shape, uh, like a pill capsule, uh, wider across uh, than it is from front to back. So it's very oblong. In the patient with emphysema, they develop this barrel chest, and over time it gets worse and worse where that actually, if you would cut them in half, you would have a round appearance to it, not the oblong side to side, but the rounded uh, shape to it. Um, and it's uh, from some air trapping as well as uh, the development of these accessory muscles. COPD um, is once, you, once you're blessed with it, you get to keep it forever. Um, it's one of those things that uh, uh, you never get rid of. You, you uh, can learn to manage it better, uh, and you can do uh, um, a lot to uh, improve uh, the patient's function, but it's something that they'll have to continuously deal with. Um, stopping smoking does slow the progress of the disease. Uh, my mother was diagnosed with uh, emphysema a number of years ago. Um, I guess the best thing about it is it did make her stop smoking. Um, and it'll slow that progression of the disease, but it will never completely reverse. Now, you can re regain a lot of lung function uh, by stopping smoking. Uh, you can reduce a lot of uh, additional uh, potential medical problems by uh, stopping smoking. Uh, there, there's uh, scientific studies uh, and a lot of data uh, that supports this. Pneumonia and spontaneous pneumothorax are very common complications of COPD. Pneumonia, because they don't move their air well, things get trapped in there. It can uh, continue to grow and develop into uh, uh, worse and worse infections. Uh, these, the uh, spontaneous pneumothorax, fairly common uh, when it comes to uh, having weak walls in the lungs. So you have weak spots on the lungs and uh, Sometimes that weak spot gives out, blevies, and now they have a, a pneumo. So they're leaking air between their two um, uh, membranes. Most patients on COPD are on uh, some corticosteroids. They're probably on anti-inflammatory drugs, um, which have some uh, issues with some side effects. It increases their risk of infection, so it's kind of a double whammy. We try to reduce the infl inflammation, making it easier to breathe. However, it makes it easier for them to, to come down with an infection. Um, most of them are also on oxygen. Uh, those oxygen-wearing folks who choose not to stop smoking have an increased risk of uh, catching on fire. Uh, they're not going to explode, but have potentially catch on fire. Um, they also will tend to be on a number of bronchodilators. And we talked about some of those different ones that were, uh, earlier in this slide or in this uh, presentation where there was the um, standard uh, beta-2 agonists like Proventil or 
albuterol uh, or some of the uh, the bigger things like the xanthine derivatives and whatnot. So you have a, uh, you also have patients that have, uh, you know, the singulars and uh, maybe atrop uh, atrovant, which is a protropion. So uh, probably also have some uh, nebulizers around the house. So our big goal is to improve ventilation and oxygenation. So with a thick uh, dehydrated mucus in the lungs, it leads to obstruction and then hydration decreases the mucus plugging. So keeping these people well hydrated, making sure that they're drinking plenty of water um, helps to uh, decrease the thickness of their mucus. So um, keeping them well hydrated can be very helpful and that's why sometimes giving them a little bit of fluid early on in the process if we're comfortable that it is a COPD issue uh, can help with that. Uh, keep in mind that patients with COPD are prone to, right, to heart failure, so we can easily fluidly overload them. So doing a, an adequate assessment, checking for things like edema, talking to them about their medical history, see if they're on drugs like Lasix, those sorts of things can help us pinpoint whether or not this is a patient we can be a little more free with our fluids or do we have to be a little more reserved with our fluids. Additionally, we can also use saline to nebulize uh, bronchodilators, uh, or, or the saline used to nebulize bronchodilators. So most of our albuterol comes in a saline. Uh, it also helps thin this out, it humidifies it, and it helps make it uh, easier for them to move some mucus. Um, if we have the capability of humidifying oxygen, uh, that can be a, an enormous help as well. Uh, humidifying the oxygen uh, keeps from drying out the membranes. Uh, and it helps to thin the mucuses. So um, our major uh, goals in management of COPD patient, we're going to try the uh, bronchodilators such as albuterol. We may consider uh, the use of, C of CPAP should we not gain a lot of uh, assistance from the bronchodilator. We may also consider epinephrine, uh, patients with very severe respiratory distress, just like the asthma patient can benefit from uh, some sub-Q epinephrine, so can the COPD patient. So uh, on top of our standard oxygen that we've learned way back in the day, uh, that's a, the majority of our treatment. Of course, we have respiratory failure or respiratory arrest, and ventilation is going to be uh, key. And then we move on to asthma. So asthma, like I said, is an obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, it does cause some obstruction of the respiratory tract. Uh, 23 million people in the United States suffer from asthma, which is a chronic inflammation of the airway with reversible episodes of obstruction. So um, asthma affects people of all ages. Uh, untreated asthma can also lead to death. So it's not just a childhood disease. Sometimes people will have it in childhood kind of basically grow out of it and then uh, have a relapse later in, in adulthood. Some kids never get it back. Um, and then sometimes people don't even develop as, uh, asthma until they're uh, later in life. So it, it's not uh, a disease of the weak. Uh, in fact, uh, my youngest son uh, is uh, the biggest kid on the football team, uh, on the varsity football team where he goes to school, uh, and he has asthma. So. I think I mentioned before, sometimes people will take a couple of puffs off their inhaler before physical activity, uh, and that is exactly what, what my son does. Is, uh, he takes a couple of hits off of his albuterol inhaler um, and, and generally does very well uh, throughout the game. So it really doesn't slow him down. So with asthma, we have a couple of things that actually occur. We have inflammation and bronchoconstriction. So we have the spasm, more or less, of our bronchioles, so they constrict, um, and then we have mucus, which is trying to to wash away the irritant, um, and this mucus uh, starts to build up some edema and bronchial linings. So several things actually make the the air passages much smaller than uh, we're used to. Um, <clears throat> a chronic inflammation uh, of the 
uh, the bronchioles causes an asthma attack. Uh, so it's something that uh, uh, they've had some inflammation, had some inflammation, and all of a sudden now bronchial spasms and you get this attack. Uh, there are lung irritants that can constrict these as well. Typical sign of this, the most common sign of this is wheezing um, and overinflation of the alveoli. In most cases, when we're talking COPD and asthma, the biggest problem that these people actually face is the inability to get air out as opposed to get air in. Uh, they, yes, they can't get air in, but the problem is because they can't get the last breath out. So they have this air trapped, and if you can't move something out, you can't put something new in. So signs and symptoms of asthma attack, mild versus severe. And the most severe asthma attacks are referred to as status asthmaticus, but uh, the most severe status asthmaticus. So to look at these, and if you want to take a better look at this, it's on 522 in your text. Um, they, uh, a mild attack will have a non-productive cough, may be worse at night, may cause you to have some problems sleeping. Um, wheezing, uh, and that may be induced by exercise, infection, exposure to certain triggers such as an irritant. Usually it's an expiratory wheeze, so as they, they breathe in, you may not hear much, but as they breathe out, you hear a, a definite musical wheeze. Some tightness in their chest, shortness of breath, tach tachypnea, tachycardia, um, anxiety, but in general, their SATs will be better than 95% before oxygen. They do generally pretty well. It's just they struggle. A more severe asthma attack, so talking potentially somebody is status asthmaticus, um, they're fatigued, they're exhausted, unable to speak, uh, they have confusion or drowsiness, cyanosis, diminished or absent breath sounds, tachycardia or bradycardia if they've worn out, tachypnea, greater than 30 per minute beats, breaths per minute, uh, diaphoresis, so they're sweaty, and generally their SATs are below 90%. So what are some asthma triggers? Most common asthma triggers include things like um, cold air, The uh, environment with various pollens and whatnot will cause some physical activity. It's a fairly common trigger. So what are some types of inhaled medications for asthma and COPD not intended for use in emergencies? Well, if we go back and think about uh, some of those meds we talked about way earlier in the COPD, we talked about things such as the leukotriene inhibitors like Singular, um, things like um, antitussives and mucolytics, um, even some of the, the steroids. Now, paramedics do occasionally give steroids to these patients. The, the thing about that is, though, is steroids, when we give patients steroids like solumedrol, um, we don't get any benefit from that in the field. It's what it's going to benefit them once they get into the ER. So all inhalers, all nebulizers, are not created equal. They're not all intended to treat uh, an attack. So for the management of asthma, uh, when we talk about um, asthma management, we're looking at things such as anti-inflammatory agents to decrease attacks. So they may be on a steroid, um, at least in a, over a shorter period of time, they may be on a steroid that's going to help um, reduce their inflammation. So if they have less inflammation, their linings are thick are, uh, are thinner, their tubes or their lumen are open, and uh, it's much easier for them to move air in and out. Bronchodilators, uh, either as a preventative measure or as a treatment for an acute attack, these are most commonly beta-2 agonists and can be anticholinergic agents, so duoneb uh, potentially. We have that condition called status asthmaticus. This is a severe, prolonged, life-threatening asthma attack. Um, and 
this is when we start to see respiratory failure. Usually this lasts you know, over a period of about uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, and goes unresolved. For patients with status asthmaticus, usually um, IVs, albuterol, oxygen, and epinephrine, uh, epinephrine sub-Q epi, 0.3-0.5 sub-Q epi, are the appropriate uh, treatments for that. Uh, patient with status asthmaticus can very quickly proceed to respiratory failure. So um, this is definitely not something to, uh, to dink around with. So although wheezing is a common sign of an asthma attack, keep two things in mind. First, all that wheezes is not asthma. Other conditions which may require different treatment will also cause wheezing. Occasionally things like pulmonary embolism or pulmonary edema will cause some wheezing um, in which it is not asthma. It is shortness of breath. It may be treated similarly, but it is not specifically asthma. So make sure we're maintaining airways, suctioning as necessary, BVM uh, to ventilate the patient, oxygen uh, to support their SpO2, and then occasionally they're also uh, now calling for CPAP uh, to assist with um, the management of asthma as well. So uh, it helps splint open those airways. Secondly, wheezing can only occur if a certain amount of air is moving through the bronchioles. So if we have a patient who is so full, their, their airways are so constricted and their, all their alveoli are packed with, oxygen, or packed with air that they can't get out, um, then they're not going to have any lung sounds. Lung sounds occur when air moves back and forth. So if we have no air moving, we have what we call either greatly diminished or absent lung sounds, um, that person is in a lot of trouble. Um, that person is, has a, uh, a high potential to have a uh, uh, respiratory failure and or uh, apnea. Pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolism is an obstruction of blood flow through the pulmonary artery system by a blood clot or an embolus, emboli. Um, the imbalance in ventilation and perfusion in the lung is called a ventilatory or ventilation perfusion mismatch, often called VQ mismatch. Um, that VQ mismatch says oxygen is just moving back and forth in and out like nobody else's business. The lung doesn't realize that it's not actually giving its oxygen um, because there's no blood flowing through those capillaries. The capillaries are at a standstill. The alveoli are still working just fine initially. Eventually, with that blood stagnating and sitting still there, then some of that starts to leak over into the alveoli, and that eventually becomes uh, a problematic area. The body it knows, hey, I'm not getting enough oxygen here, but the lung's like, I don't know why I'm doing my job. Everything's cool here. Uh, so the body actually starts ramping up and saying, hey, we're short of breath. Let's, re let's breathe a little faster. It sends signals to the brain saying, we're not getting enough. Crack down on the lungs. And uh, that's where some of that ventilatory perfusion mismatch, because the blood's still pumping through, but the blood's not getting oxygenated well. Signs or symptoms of the pulmonary embolism, found on 523. Unexplained shortness of breath, kind of a new onset, sudden sort of thing. Tachypnea, tachycardia, hypotension, a feeling of anxiety or dread or um, impending doom. Syncope, or passing out, diaphoresis, chest pain, and this chest pain is a pleuritic style pain or a very sharp pain in which you can um, almost put a finger on. The other thing about it is with deep breaths, the pain changes. Um, and with uh, you know, most chest pain that is either sharp or changes with respiration um, or palpation, if you push on it, is not cardiac related. It is more commonly uh, a, a, another uh, issue. So whether it's a lung issue or a musculoskeletal issue. Um, Coughing and hemoptysis, so they're coughing up a little bit of blood. Some of that blood, remember, is kind of leaking over. 
a new onset cardiac dysrhythmia, so maybe AFib or an SVT. Swollen, tender, lower extremity, such as a calf. The reason for that is, is we get these blood clots that migrate themselves around through our body. And if you would happen to develop a blood clot in your calf and it breaks loose and it moves on through the system, it's going to get lodged in the place where it next finds the smallest blood vessels. And those next smallest blood vessels are going to be those in the capillaries of the lungs. So that's where they will lodge. So this person could have potentially had what's called a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, um, so a, an, uh, an embolism um, or, or a thrombosis is, is a blood clot that forms in place. So they may have formed a blood clot there and then this blood clot migrated to the lungs and then it becomes an embolus. Embolism is something that actually migrates in from elsewhere. So uh, that's where that would come into play. All right, a certain amount of the lung will also uh, suffer from atelectasis. I think we're going to talk about that here in just a second. So pulmonary embolism, those people can deteriorate very quickly. Depends on how big of it of a blood vessel is blocked. Uh, they can get worse despite you trying to oxygenate them. Their SATs may never come up like we were hoping. Uh, they have a quick onset hypoxia that is very difficult for us to get over. Um, occasionally we have to start ventilating those, those patients um, um, and then uh, it can also cause some increases in blood pressure because the heart has to work harder. Now, where do these blood clots come from? Well, most of them actually migrate in, uh, like I said, and when they migrate in, uh, they were formed elsewhere such as in the pelvis or the lower extremities, but why do we get them? Um, we may have got them from recent surgeries, recent traumas, been immobilized for a long period of time, whether we were at home in bed for six weeks because of uh, a pregnancy issue uh, or a fracture that required us to keep our leg elevated, something like that. Estrogen or hormone replacement such as contraceptives, smoking, um, pregnancy, all of those are common predecessors really to uh, uh, developing blood clots. Um, we can have other things that, that cause an embolism such as air or fat, um, amniotic fluid, those things can, can cause it as well, most commonly a clot though. Um, when we have these clots eventually we, we may also develop atelectasis, I've mentioned atelectasis before but atelectasis is a, um, a non-perfused portion of the lung, basically a collapsed alveoli. So um, if, they, uh, if that area of the lung isn't getting used, uh, those kind of uh, shrivel up a little bit and when you sigh, when you, when you kind of sigh, um, that is actually you reinflating uh, some of your atelectasis. So. Treatments for this, they include anticoagulation, so these people are going to end up on uh, some sort of a blood clot uh, preventative uh, drug. So. Uh, Maybe it's aspirin, maybe it's uh, something like Coumadin. Occasionally we'll use something, uh, it's called a fibrinolytic, which is actually goes in and it breaks apart blood clots. It's big, it's ugly, it's nasty. Um, but uh, so fibrinolytic therapy can get used and occasionally they actually have to go in there and remove it. So a uh, few things. Things that we're going to do for this patient are going to include things such as um, starting an IV, so that we're going to make sure that if they're hypotensive we administer some fluids, kind of helps uh, uh, move things along the system a little easier. We have a little less, uh, a, a lower viscosity, so uh, we can increase, uh, move the, the, the solid parts of the blood around the system easier with more fluid in there. And as, the rest of it is all uh, supportive therapy, so it's going to be things like oxygen, airway, ventilation with a BVM. We're, we're probably not going to use CPAP on this person. CPAP is not going to generally benefit them. Not to mention CPAP is contraindicated in the patient who is hypotensive and many of our uh, PE uh, patients have hypotension. 
risk factors for pulmonary embolism brought those up just a moment ago. <clears throat> All right, pulmonary edema. Uh, pulmonary edema occurs when we increase uh, the interstitial fluid uh, and that then distances the gas diffusion. So think about this. If we have a alveoli and a capillary that sit right next to each other with one very, very minute little amount of fluid in between them, it's fairly easy for gas to move across from one side to another. Um, so say it, we'll call it a, a screen. We'll, we'll say we have a screen door in between. When we start to add layers to that, so now we close the glass in the screen door. Now that spreads it out a little harder. It's harder for gas to get through there. And then we close the big heavy wooden door. Now it's even harder. So with pulmonary edema, it's much, or much like that. Uh, we add more and more layers between the um, alveoli and the capillary. So it makes it very much uh, a very much more difficult process to move the, the gases across. In many cases, we're actually referring to a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which comes from CHF, or heart failure. Um, and in these cases, uh, and most, uh, most of the time, it is a, a left-sided cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So the left side of the heart has failed, fluid backs up. Where does the fluid for the left side come from? It comes from the lungs. So when the fluid sits there and stagnates, then it starts to, um, it starts to uh, create extra barriers. In some cases, nitroglycerin is administered sublingually for this. Paramedics do this. It is not routinely given by AEMTs for, uh, for pulmonary edema. Uh, this may change sometime in the future, but currently um, the treatment for pulmonary edema at the AEMT level is all supportive care and uh, calling for paramedic assist. We also occasionally will have some non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema causes. So something called acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is there's been a major um, uh, major insult to the lungs. Maybe the lungs were uh, hypoxic for a while. There was some sort of an injury, such as uh, a large blunt chest trauma. Um, those sorts of things, uh, pneumonias drug overdoses, aspirations, those can all lead to ARDS. Um, we also may have some toxin-induced lung injury. So <coughs> uh, very, for whatever the reason, uh, there's been a major injury to the lungs. Uh, also sometimes comes with uh, exposure to certain toxic gases. So maybe like uh, anhydrous ammonia. We could have uh, exposure to uh, smoke or other, uh, say, agricultural gases. So those sorts of things can uh, lead to uh, pulmonary edema, particularly anhydrous ammonia. Anhydrous ammonia loves water, and so it's just going to keep pulling water in. So complications um, of a severe illness, most people with ARDS, um, are going to be in the ICU. We may see them on an interfacility transport. ARDS has a very high mortality rate, so uh, people who develop uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome um, do typically die. So it, it's not a not something a lot of people come out of. Uh, Pre-hospital treatment is all supportive. It's airway, it's ventilation, it's oxygenation. So. Um, sometimes we have patients who have pulmonary edema, whether it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. It's so bad, uh, they're almost foaming at the mouth. They maybe have pink, uh, frothy sputum. Uh, COPD, or I'm sorry, uh, CPAP may be beneficial to these people if they're not too sick, if they can maintain their own airway and their blood pressure is supporting it. Um, otherwise, we may need to, to ventilate this, these people. So if we need to uh, uh, bag them, maybe with an NPA or an OPA. Uh, that's our, our main goal. So 
a number of toxic substances reach our lungs, either by inhalation or blood circulation, it can lead to non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and other uh, damage to the lungs may not be evident immediately after the exposure. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as a delayed toxin-induced lung injury. So like I said, maybe it was something like along the lines of, of a uh, agricultural gas. A spontaneous pneumothorax. So a pneumothorax is a condition in which the air uh, is accumulating between the two layers of the pleura. So between the visceral and the parietal pleura. Visceral pleura is the lining out on the outside of the lung. Parietal pleura, the lining on the inside of the chest wall. Uh, these two layers typically have a very thin, minute amount of fluid between them that helps them move back and forth easily uh, without uh, causing any rubbing or friction. When we have a pneumothorax, we actually have air in between those two uh, that shouldn't be there. Uh, spontaneous is one that actually just happens really without, uh, without uh, traumatic uh, initiation. The most common people who develop spontaneous pneumothorax are thin, young, tall males. Um, maybe that they also have a history of asthma. Could be that they have a smoking history um, or some other lung disease. But uh, that's the most common uh, people that we see it in, thin, young, tall males. Uh, COPD patients often will develop spontaneous pneumothorax, as, as do those with lung cancer. So this air is accumulating there, often without trauma. You can have that spontaneous. Is we have no no specific um, reason to believe uh, you know, something happened. It didn't get shot or stabbed or something. Simple pneumothorax. This is an area of the lung ruptures. Air leaks out and accumulates in that pleural space. There are plenty of people actually who run around with a simple pneumothorax, and we're not even and they're not even aware of it. Um, those people that are kind of, uh, well, we'll say healthcare providers because we don't want to ever go to the hospital. Um, yeah, they maybe are complaining of very mild, very, very mild shortness of breath and um, some pain up in one of their shoulders. They may go in and get a chest x-ray and all of a sudden, next thing you know, there's a little bit of air that's leaked in that pearl space and they have this little simple pneumothorax. Um, so sometimes people get it, they don't even realize they have it, and it actually fixes itself. Um, eventually, uh, that lung tissue heals, and the air gets reabsorbed by the body. So. All right, however, it can lead to, uh, depending on how bad it is, it can, can present with some significant pain. Uh, you can get some on, sudden onset dyspnea, maybe a gradually uh, imp increasing amount of shortness of breath can eventually lead to some tachycardia and, and uh, hypoxia. Lung sounds will often be absent on the affected area, but it's going to have to be a fairly large size uh, pneumothorax in order to even know this uh, because the uh, a lot of people with a simple pneumothorax, we're talking a half an inch at the top of, uh, of the lung that uh, is all the air that's trapped there. So it's not a huge amount. So breath sounds from the functioning area of the lungs are probably going to be just fine. All right, <clears throat> so treating a spontaneous pneumothorax, usually oxygenation and a comfortable position is all that these people are going to need. Do not use CPAP or administered nitrous oxide in the patient with a suspected pneumothorax. So if we have a re reason to believe that uh, we have a, a uh, pneumothorax, using CPAP is going to actually make it bigger, quicker, and uh, nitrous oxide really can affect deoxygenation. Um, reassess your patient very frequently. Keep an eye on their mental status. Remember that changes quickly. Uh, their breathing, lung sounds, and their saturations. Now, a patient can also develop what is referred to as a tension pneumothorax. Um, and a tension pneumothorax is when so much air has leaked into the patient's uh, chest 
it is now compressing everything else that's within the chest. So with a tension pneumothorax, it is a progressively worsening and incredibly severe shortness of breath. Their hypoxia is increasingly severe. Their lung sounds are first affected on the pneumothorax side and eventually will be very decreased on the good side because that good lung is being compressed by the buildup of air. Um, they may or may not ha have chest pain in the simple pneumothorax. They almost always have chest pain with a tension pneumothorax. Um, they will eventually develop hypotension, tachycardia. They will have JVD, so JVD being a key uh, identifier here because of the increase in pressure in the chest. Uh, it can lead to cardiac dysrhythmias and eventually cardiac arrest. So if you remember we talked about H's and T's um, in the cardiac arrest section, one of those was tension pneumothorax. And then other possible findings, pulsus paradoxus, tracheal deviation away from the affected side, usually a late sign. Most people you see tracheal deviation on it, they're actually dead. Uh, a hyperexpansion of the chest, so very, very overinflated chest. They may have hyperresidence of the chest on percussion. So as you tap uh, for percussion, tap on the one finger, uh, it, it echoes almost. Uh, you can kind of hear, hear it actually very, very uh, easy to, to uh, move sound. So, uh, that pulse is paradox. Just remember it, uh, that the quality of the pulse changes with inspiration. So this is a large defect in the lung, cannot seal itself, air is going to just continue to escape. This is a critical life-threatening emergency. Treatment for this, you support the airway, the oxygenation, cautiously ventilate these people. Don't over overventilate these people. If you overventilate these people, you're just making it worse. Um, and call for paramedics. Um, the paramedics are able to do what's called needle thoracostomy, where we'll take a needle will stick it actually through their chest wall and allow air to escape. Um, eventually this person ends up with what's called a chest tube um, in the hospital and that chest tube uh, allows for the remainder of the lung to uh, re-expand. So tension pneumothorax characterized severe dyspnea, respiratory failure, sinus, distended neck veins, and hypotension. Regardless, if we're treating uh, either type of pneumothorax, oxygenation is appropriate, cautious ventilation as necessary, IV fluid, you can start an IV, it would be okay, uh, but be cautious that we don't overdo it with IV fluids. So the lung sounds will often be absent on the affected side, and then the breath sounds from the functioning area of the lung can be transmitted uh, through the chest wall. So it can be difficult to detect. Um, you might call this diminished rather than absent lung sounds. So um, you kind of hear it, it's almost faint in the background. That is, uh, it's actually a transmitted or diminished lung sound. Hyperventilation syndrome. Hyperventilation syndrome uh, is a condition in which the patient's minute ventilation exceeds their metabolic demand. So usually uh, this is caused by an anxiety, so we hear about people hyperventilating a lot, uh, people with panic disorder sometimes will hyperventilate a lot, and um, they may also develop things like chest pain, dizziness, uh, near syncope, uh, weakness, paresthesias where they get kind of that pins and needle feel, uh, and carpopedal spasm. Carpopedal spasm is when they get contraction of the fingers and of the, the fingers, the hands, the toes, and the feet. They also will a lot of times complain of having uh, numbness and tingling across their face. Um, these sort of things come because the oxygen to CO2 level is so out of whack, it's so out of proportion. They have high levels of oxygen and low levels of CO2 that the body's kind of in, uh, in a little bit of an uproar. So just because they're hyperventilating does not mean that there isn't a medical problem does not mean it is always a psychiatric or a behavioral issue. Um, so we have to be very cautious. We've got, gotten away from breathing into the paper bag 
to have the patient um, uh, try to, to self-correct their CO2 level. Um, and we used to also treat this by putting a patient on an honorary breather but not turning the O2 on. Um, because there's the possibility that there actually is a medical problem associated with this, we've kind of gotten away from that. So really the best thing here is coaching. Uh, so coaching uh, this patient, trying to help them draw their attention away from whatever it is that's causing them to be uh, upset uh, uh, is one of the best things we can do for this. Um, spontaneous pneumothorax or a pulmonary embolism also could be, uh, could look very similar to a hyperventilation syndrome. Both of those need oxygenation. So that's why we don't, uh, we don't have them rebreathe their own CO2. Um, so we can provide them with some supplemental O2, try to, to uh, keep their SATs above 95% but try to focus them on slowing down their breathing, take nice, slow, deeper breaths, rather than very, very fast, very, very shallow breaths. So uh, if in doubt, uh, certainly talks about you could treat this, uh, if the patient develops some chest pain, you could treat it with some nitroglycerin. However, in most cases, uh, it's not going to have any, uh, any effect. So again, Coaching, coaching, coaching. That's that's the big key here. Uh, trying to draw their attention away. When we talked about that one. All right. Respiratory infectious disease. All kinds of stuff. Viri, fungi, bacteria. Any of those can cause uh, infection. Uh, the upper, lower airway. Uh, depending on what we're talking about, we may have a pneumonia, which affects certain areas of uh, lung tissue. We might have an upper respiratory infection. Many of us uh, deal with those on a regular basis during the winter. Um, you know, we might have uh, something very, very, very uh, life-threatening like uh, epiglottitis. We may have something more uh, low-key. I mean, croup is very common, but doesn't tend to ha to have a, a lot of uh, um, casualties to it. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff that can affect us. Pneumonia, when we talk about pneumonia, we're talking about things uh, uh, that is an infectious disease. It can be any of the, uh, actually it can be, it can be bacterial, it can be viral, it can be fun, fungal, it can, act, can be aspiration where you sucked a, a foreign body into your lungs. Pneumonia is a very common nosocomial infection, which means it was acquired in the healthcare setting. People who are commonly uh, confined uh, to a facility, so nursing homes, for example, have higher risks of pneumonias. Uh, they pass it around. Uh, it can be fatal, particularly in those with weak immune systems, including the elderly. They may also have pre-existing conditions such as asthma, COPD, and heart failure, which make it that much easier for them to get this. Common for patients who are immobile. Uh, so pneumonia, we're right in the heart of pneumonia season right now. Um, it's commonly seen as a patient has cough, difficulty breathing, probably have the chills, normally have a fever, and commonly complaining of malaise or just generally being exhausted. Another very common thing we see is when they cough, it is a productive cough. So the cough, I, I like to call it a cough of the present. So you cough up something. And when they spit it out, uh, the sputum is yellow, yellowish green, or even rusty color because there may be some blood mixed in. They are almost always dehydrated. So, um, but there are a few patients that have pulmonary edema um, because it's complicated their congestive heart failure as well. So comparing and contrasting a cardiogenic pulmonary edema versus a pneumonia, um, just uh, real, real quickly, uh, we're going to uh, just kind of draw your attention to pathophysiology. Uh, pulmonary edema usually affects both lungs. We have it's from leaky capillaries and fluid building up, whereas in pneumonia, there's alveoli in a specific area, uh, maybe one lobe, maybe one lung, uh, is usually affected by pneumonia.
So one area is usually um, onset pulmonary edema almost always comes on at night with the patient lying down uh, in a sudden onset, whereas pneumonia uh, comes on really about any time. It's very progressive, um, and they usually have some sort of a, a history of being ill. So pulmonary edema, they went to bed fine, they woke up and can't breathe. Pneumonia is usually, I've been sick for a couple of days, and now it's just gotten to the point. Additionally, Signs or symptoms of pulmonary edema include orthopnea. They have to sit up to breathe. Pneumonia doesn't matter. Um, history of ex dyspnea on exertion, where anytime they try to do anything, uh, the uh, pulmonary edema uh, knocks them down. Um, they may have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, where it's mostly related to uh, night. Um, altered mental status, JVD, pink frothy sputum, uh, peripheral edema. Um, crackles. However, the crackles are usually widespread. Maybe have some wheezing. Where we look at pneumonia, we've got the malaise. They, they're not really positional. Um, they usually have a fever. Usually have no appetite. Probably have a green, yellow, or rust-colored sputum. Their crackles or rails are usually uh, in certain areas as opposed to widespread. They may complain of some pleuritic style chest pain. Management, uh, management for pulmonary edema is usually um, IV, O2, CPAP, um, maybe nitro depending on your protocols and your, your uh, medical director. However, right now it's not the standard for AEMTs. Whereas pneumonia, oxygen and fluids, assisting ventilation. CPAP is not absolutely contraindicated. However, CPAP is not uh, commonly indicated for pneumonia. We may also be talking about something like acute bronchitis. So with acute bronchitis, um, we're talking about uh, a person who's had a sudden inflammation of the bronchi. It differs from chronic bronchitis. Um, smokers and patients with lung disease are at an increased risk for acute bronchitis, but this is not the person that has been diagnosed with chronic bronchitis. Um, many of us have suffered a bronchitis at one point or another in our life. It's typically caused by uh, viruses or bacteria. Wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, fevers, chills, malaise, their cough uh, can be productive, uh, and their sputum can be yellow, green, or streaked with blood. So between the two, they look between uh, pneumonia and acute bronchitis, it can be very, very difficult to uh, differentiate the two. People with acute bronchitis usually have a redonkulous cough, um, and it's a cough that, that almost is nonstop. So um, oxygenation, IVs uh, are going to be here in uh, supporting the, uh, the airway. IV fluids may or may not be beneficial for this person. We might also look at some things like some of our viral respiratory problems. Um, and then they, uh, they go on to talk about a couple of those uh, in the chart, uh, in the text. We're going to hit that here in just a second here. But uh, influenza, the real flu as a respiratory component. You have flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, uh, that sort of thing, headache, fever. But the real influenza has a respiratory component. SARS, uh, SARS had a huge, huge outbreak uh, a number of years ago, um, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome. And then HPS, which is the hantavirus, or hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, uh, is another big one. Uh, the flu, the common flu, is, uh, is influenza, um, and then we also have a couple of other minor uh, infectious diseases, such as the croup um, and the epiglottitis. The croup, croup um, uh, affects the uh, uh, upper airways, causes a uh, striatus seal bark cough. Uh, epiglottitis. Um, affects the epiglottis specifically, uh, it, it typically is a much more severe illness. 
we're not going to dwell much on those two here because that is a more pediatric based uh, diseases so we'll hit those again once we hit uh, the pediatric chapters um, and then of course we have our standard upper respiratory infections things like sinusitis pharyngitis laryngitis um, rhinovirus those sorts of things they're a lot, what a lot of people think oh well I've got I've got a common cold so <clears throat> so influenza SARS and uh, the hantavirus uh, all can lead to death from hypoxia. Uh, a flu vaccine is very important. If you haven't gotten one, I would recommend it. To compare uh, and contrast these diseases a little bit, influenza can be from various, dang it, 